You know, much of modern evangelical Christianity today, in my estimation, is obsessed with and infatuated over an infatuation, a preoccupation with the signs of the times and whether or not we are living as God's people in that final generation before Christ's return. I don't think it'll take very long for you to see that. Just go peruse a Christian bookstore. Go look at the bestsellers list on Amazon in the Christian category, and you're bound to find a plethora of options of authors theorizing and hypothesizing the end of the age, interpreting every modern sign that they come across and what that might find its fulfillment in the Old Testament or New Testament prophecy. And just taking some of the language that we're going to see from our passage today, perhaps you, hopefully you've read our passage in advance. If not, you'll recognize some of this language. But just taking some of this passage from Mark 13, listen to how one popular Bible teacher does this very thing. I'm not going to name who it is, but it is someone that you could find very easily on TV. Speaking to Jesus' prediction that there will be escalations in worldwide conflicts and wars and rumors of wars, as Jesus says here in Mark 13, he writes, There is at least one military weapon and 4,000 pounds of explosives for every man, woman, and child on earth today. In 2019, global military expenditures grew to an astonishing $1.92 trillion. And what are we to think of all this? He writes, well, long ago, the Bible predicted an escalation of conflict, border skirmishes, race wars, and national battles during the end times, and we are living in such end times. Or take the language of famines and earthquakes again from our pastors this morning. He writes, we live in a day when we can scarcely turn on the TV without seeing someone trying to raise money to feed the hungry. Millions of people in the world raise for food and insecurity. He writes of earthquakes, all of these devastating trends are signs that point to the imminent return of our and our generation of Jesus Christ. He goes on to do this about the language of persecutions and tribulations, so on and so forth. Well, what are we as Christians, to make of all of this? Are we to seek to do what this author is doing? Are we to seek to interpret modern times as such signs of the times of the end of our age and the return of Christ? Which biblical prophecies are we to seek to interpret by such events? Which biblical prophecies are future? Which are yet to be fulfilled? Which are the ones that have already been fulfilled? How about this passage before us, Mark 13? There is so much prophetic language here in Mark 13. When Jesus is teaching his disciples on the Mount of Olives, in which of these two categories does this passage fit? Yet to be fulfilled or already fulfilled? Over the next few weeks, I hope to address this passage and answer some of these questions. We come, as we come to Mark 13, we come to, as R.C. Sproul put it, some very troubling waters. Very complicated passage. Most commentators would agree that here in Mark 13, we come to the most difficult to interpret passage in the entire gospel of Mark. Now, some of you know where I'm going to go, and you have been dreading this day for a year as we have been coming to Mark 13, and these will be a painful few weeks for you. I apologize in advance for that. Some of you have no idea where I'm going, and and you read Mark 13, and you say, I have no idea what he's talking about. I hope to offer perhaps some clarity over the next few weeks for us. We will be in this chapter, Mark 13, this week and the next two weeks. And before we embark on this study, let me just say a couple things by way of introduction. Let me encourage and ask you to do a couple things. The first thing I think is important is for us to see our interpretation of this passage as not a matter of primary importance, but a matter of secondary, even tertiary importance. To to put it another way, as we come to this passage, however you take Jesus' prophecies and how they are to be fulfilled, I think we should hold our interpretation with an open hand, not a closed hand. That, That is, we should be able and willing as brothers and sisters in Christ to agree to disagree on this issue. And and not forsake our common bond in our union of Christ and on the essential doctrines of theology. Listen, there are many things that we cannot agree to disagree on, right? 
We cannot agree to disagree as brothers and sisters in Christ on the divinity of Jesus or whether or not this word is inerrant and sufficient, or whether or not our God is triune in nature. There are several things that we must divide over if we disagree on. But listen, this is not one of those things. As we think about the timing of Jesus' return, as we think about biblical prophecy and whether it has been fulfilled or whether it is yet to be fulfilled, these are things that I think as God's people we should study and seek to understand and have clarity on. But we should not walk away disagreeing and because we disagree, dividing over these issues. I say this because as I was telling one of our elders the other day, there is a good chance between this morning and the next two weeks that I will say something from this passage that every single one of you will disagree with. Right? Because it's such a complicated passage. And it's a passage with so many different layers of complexity and understanding. It's almost inevitable because we all come to this passage not only trying to understand that complexity, but we all come with layers and layers of baggage, as it were, to, to uh, past understanding and how we have understood this passage. That it's just bound to happen. And that leads me to the second thing to ask of you this morning as we embark on this study. Number one, hold it with an open hand. Be willing to agree to disagree. Number two, I would ask, is to try your best, as best you're able, to come to this study of Mark 13 with an open mind. Right? To be willing to come to God's word this morning, to study it in context, even if perhaps your conclusions lead you to disagree with a particular system of theology that you might have held for quite some time. Listen, we all have our systems of theology, right? And theological systems are important. I'd even argue that they are necessary to cohesively understand all of God's word and how it all interrelates. But we must always be careful not to let our theological system trump our basic hermeneutics of any given passage of God's word. We cannot let how we think about the end times in general trump how we hermeneutically, linguistically, and exegetically understand any given passage, including this here in Mark 13. So those are my statements by way of introduction. Come with an open mind. Be willing to, ad to agree to disagree. And I look forward to having conversations with you over the next few weeks, trying to understand together this difficult passage of Mark 13. Well, with that said, open your Bibles with, you, with me, if you will. Mark 13, I'm going to read the entire chapter so that we see it all in context this morning. Then we will walk through the first 13 verses. Mark 13, verse 1. And as he came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings. And Jesus said to him, Do you see these great buildings? There will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. And as he sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him privately, tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign when all these things are about to be accomplished? And Jesus began to say to them, see that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name saying, I am he, and they will lead many astray. And when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. These are but the beginning of the birth pains. But be on your guard, for they will deliver you over to councils, and you will be beaten in synagogues, and you will stand before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them. And the gospel must first be proclaimed to all nations. And when they bring you to trial and deliver you over, do not be anxious beforehand what you are to say, but say whatever is given you in that hour. For it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. And brother will deliver brother over to death, and the father his child, and child will rise against parents and have them put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. But when you see the abomination of desolation standing where he ought not to be, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let the one who is on the housetop not go down, nor enter his house to take anything out. And let the one who is in the field not turn back to take his cloak. And alas, for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days, pray that it may not happen in winter 
For in those days there will be such tribulation as has not been from the beginning of the creation that God created until, until now and never will be. And if the Lord had not cut short the days, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect whom he chose, he shortened the days. And then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or look, there he is, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform signs and wonders to lead you astray, if possible, the elect. But be on guard, I have told you all things beforehand. But in those days after the tribulation, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will be falling from heaven and the powers and the heavens will be shaken and then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. And then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. From the fig tree, learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts out its leaves, you know that the summer is near. So also, when you see these things take place, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly, I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But concerning that day or that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard, keep awake, for you do not know when the time will come. It's like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and puts his servants in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening, or at midnight, or when the rooster crows, or in the morning lest he come suddenly and find you asleep. And what I say to you, I say to all, stay awake. That is the entirety of the passage before us the next few weeks. Listen, as I have studied this passage for weeks and weeks leading up to this, this morning and, and really concentrated this last week, I've, to be honest with you, I've really wrestled with how to best present the truths here in Mark 13. I've talked to several people about this. If I had a couple hours with each of you, sit down one-on-one, -on -one, just walk through verse by verse, I think it would be pretty easy. We could talk, we could ask questions, we could dialogue, we could go back and forth. But in a sermon, in a series of sermons, I've really struggled with how best to serve the meal, how best to prepare the meal and serve it out to you. Well, here's what I've decided. Best, not best, I'm not sure. But what I think is best is to simply rip the Band-Aid from the beginning. Rip the Band-Aid from the beginning, tell you how I think we should interpret this passage as a whole, and then back up and start walking through it verse by verse. So in summary, I believe that this passage is not pointing to the future return of Jesus in his second coming, but instead was a prophecy about the destruction of the temple in AD 70, and thus has already been fulfilled. Now, why do I come to that conclusion? Let me give you two major considerations for us to think on. The first major consideration for us to think on is the context of verses 1 through 5. And really, that is the context of the passage. The context here is we have Jesus and his disciples exiting the temple. And as they exit, one of the disciples, we don't know which one, in my mind, I think it's probably Peter. He's usually the one to be more quick to speak. One of the disciples takes note of the wonderful stones and the wonderful buildings, the grandness of the temple out of which they are leaving. And then we have, look at Jesus' statement in verse 2. I believe this statement drives the rest of the passage. Do you see these great buildings? Talking about the temple, there will not be left one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. Listen, this temple was, that was being marveled at was certainly worthy of such marvel. Uh, of marvel. This temple, this was not the, the temple of Solomon that he built in the 10th, 10th century. Remember, that, that temple was destroyed in 587 when the Babylonians came in and conquered Jerusalem. Rather, this was the temple that was rebuilt after that destruction. It's the one that Herod the Great began to remodel. It was thus known as Herod's Temple. This was a temple, this was a complex that covered 35 acres. Just think about the, the vastness of that, 35 acres. It was one of the great wonders of the Roman world. The sanctuary stood 150 feet tall, as did the temple wall surrounding it. 
Uh, the columns that held up the portico were so large that three grown men putting their arms hand to hand could barely circle around the column. That's how grand and large it was. The ancient historian Josephus tells us that some of the stones that made up this temple, they were 60 feet long, 11 feet high, <clears throat> and 8 feet deep, with each stone weighing more than a million pounds. Other historians talk about this temple and say it looks like a, a mountain of marble covered in gold. So you see, this, <clears throat> this temple complex was, it was architecturally stunning, and it must have looked like it was going to stand for thousands and thousands of years. There was nothing that could destroy this temple. There was nothing that could come against it. But now we have here in verse 2, Jesus says, he's prophesying, he says, one day there will be a time when not a single stone will be left on another. He's prophesying here in verse 2, the destruction of the temple. And then verse 3, they move uh, across the way, as it were, opposite the temple to the Mount of Olives. This was a, a mountain that stood, they would have stood about 150 foot above Jerusalem, looking down upon the temple. It would have been a grand view, dramatic view of the temple in question. And it's here, uh, while they're at the Mount of Olives, after they've received the prophecy from Jesus in verse 2, it's here in verse 4, that these four disciples that are with Jesus asks him this question. Tell us, when will these things be, and what will be the sign of all of these things about to be accomplished? Listen, in its immediate context, what do the disciples have to be referring to here when asking this question? When will these things happen? What's going to be the signs of these things taking place? It has to be the prophecy that Jesus just gave in verse 2, that being the destruction of the temple. They hear this prophecy that Jesus gives, and their immediate thought is, when is this going to happen, and how do I know it's about to happen? Well, what follows then, verse 5, I believe, all the way down through the end of the passage, is Jesus answering that very question. Jesus answering the when and the signs. So that's my first thing that leads to this conclusion, the immediate context. Jesus foretells the destruction of the temple. The disciples ask follow-up question about that prophecy, and then Jesus answers their question. The second major thing to consider, and I would say that this is actually the linchpin of understanding this entire passage, is the meaning of generation in verse 30. Indeed, I think this is the most important piece of the puzzle to see how we understand whether this is to be fulfilled prophecy or already fulfilled prophecy. Look there at verse 30. At the end of all of these signs that he gives, he tells them, truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away, that is die. This generation will not pass away until all of these things take place. Notice here that both the disciples question and the and Jesus's answer includes these words these things the question what will be a sign of these things when will these things happen verse 30 this generation will not pass away until these things take place a crucial question for us before we even talk about generation is what is meant here by Jesus when he says these things well, my goal over the next couple of weeks is to show you why I am convinced that they are talking about the same thing. The prophecy that Jesus gave concerning the temple is the same thing Jesus is referring to here in verse 30. But the major question for us is, what does Jesus mean when he says, this generation will not pass away until these things take place? Well, let me give you three options that are very common. Option number one, you could say, well, Jesus meant this generation to whom he was talking, people living right now, this generation will not die, and then he was right. So he was, he was saying, all of these things are going to happen before all of you die. Okay, that's option number one. Option number two is he was also saying that all of these things are going to happen before you die, but he was wrong because they didn't actually happen. Option number three is that Jesus actually means something different than the normal usage of the word generation and actually means something along the lines of 
the Jewish race or those who believe the gospel rather than the physical generation of those living. Let me very quickly just walk through those in reverse order. I walk through them in reverse order because I think that latter position is the most common position among believers today. So option number one, Jesus means something different by this word generation. This specific Greek word that Mark uses in recounting Jesus' words is this word genea. It's a word, it's a word that normally means generation. It's a word that normally means those living within a particular time during a particular season. There is no linguistic or biblical justification, I do not believe, for arguing that generation here does not mean generation, but actually means race. That is how many interpret it. And they say, what Jesus is actually saying here is not that these things are going to happen during these next 30, 40 years, but what Jesus is saying is that the Jewish race will not die out until all these things take place. Listen, if that is how you understand this verse, and if that is how you have understood this verse, here's a challenge that I want to offer you, and this this is in all sincerity challenge, for you to go home this next week and to look up every single time this Greek word genea is used in the New Testament. Look up in your concordance and see if any other time, other than, as you argue in Mark 13, if any other time that word means race rather than generation. Just in the Gospels, this word is, I know you're not going to be able to write all these down, but this word is used in Matthew 117, 11, 16, 12, 39, 41, 42, 45, 16, 13, 17, 17, 23, 36, 24, 34. I'll stop there at Matthew. There's that many in each Gospel, Mark, Luke, and John. Just go look them up. And not a single one of these references is the word used to speak of an entire Jewish race living over thousands of years. Instead, every single time this word is used, it is used in the normal sense of the word. That is the sum total of those living at the same time. It always refers to contemporaries, to a specific time frame, to a specific generation, usually understood in the Jewish mind as a 30 to 40 year time frame. The challenge for the position, if this is your position, that says what Jesus means here is the Jewish race, and thus everything in Mark 13 is future and yet to be fulfilled, the challenge for you to answer and explain is why Jesus uses this word in a different way than the way it's used in every other occurrence in the New Testament. And I think this, and and if you take that position, that's fine. We can agree to disagree. But I think we need to feel the weight of this challenge. Because if this isn't what Jesus means, and you're saying that everything is still to be fulfilled in the future, then you've got a contradiction here. This was actually the problem that a British atheist philosopher, Bertrand Russell, uh, said that in interpreting Mark 13, it was here in verse 30 that led him to completely give up the Christian faith and become an atheist, because he said Jesus lied. He said he was going to come back. He said all of this, thing, all of this stuff was going to happen in this generation, and he was wrong. I, I think that oftentimes we don't feel the full effect here of verse 30. I think we need to feel the weight of what Jesus is saying and correctly understand and define what he actually means by that. Well, the second option then is to say that what Jesus means is all this is going to happen within this generation, and he was actually wrong because it didn't take place. Surprisingly, C.S. Lewis took such a position. Let me read you his words from an article he wrote. He wrote, the apocalyptic beliefs of the first Christians have been proved to be false. It's clear from the New Testament that they all expected the second coming in their own lifetime. And worse still, they had reason. And one which you will find very embarrassing, their master had told them so. He shared and indeed created their delusion. He said so in many words. This generation shall not pass until all these things be done. And he was wrong. He clearly knew no more about the end of the world than anyone else. And he goes on to talk here about this very verse to say, it is certainly the most embarrassing verse in the Bible. I hope I don't need to spend any more time than just reading that quote to convince you that that option is wrong and cannot be correct. And that leads us to the final 
and third option, the option that I personally am arguing, and that is that when Jesus says this generation will not pass away until all these things take place, that he actually means generation, that he's prophesying the destruction of the temple that he foretold in verse 2, about which he was asked in verse 5, and about which he answered from verse 5 onward, and all of that did end up taking place within the period of this generation's life. Now listen, like I said, while I believe that position and I'm going to preach as we go on in accordance with that position, if we agree to disagree, I pray that we will see our interpretation on this matter as something, again, of secondary or tertiary importance. Now, I know that was a lot. That's a lot, and we haven't even opened, we haven't even started verse 1, we haven't even started going through our verses here, but I think that's so important because how we understand the whole Affects as we walk into the specifics now and understand what Jesus is actually pointing us to. So in our time together, let me look, let me look with you, starting at verse 5. We will look down through verse 15 and see several signs that Jesus is going to point us to of this day approaching, again, that day, I believe, being the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem in AD 70. Number one, the first thing he says, the signs that he gives of that day approaching is the appearance of religious imposters and messianic pretenders. Look at verse 5 and 6. He says, See to it that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and they will lead many astray. Now, when each of these signs, the burden on me of holding the position that I do, the burden on me is to show you how I believe each of these signs were and have been fulfilled. I believe the first several are going to be pretty easy. As we go to next week, we'll find that it gets a little more difficult. But here, the appearance of religious impostors and messianic pretenders, we find examples of this all throughout the book of Acts, don't we? Acts 8, we see Simon the magician performing magic and amazing people, leading people to say, this man is the power of God that is called great. Acts 13, we're introduced to another magician, a, a false prophet named Bar Jesus, who had come through the whole island performing his magical acts. Acts 21, Paul is brought forward for questioning, and it's thought that he was, quote, the Egyptian who recently started up a revolt and led 4,000 men into the wilderness. So from the book of Acts, from biblical history, and from contemporary history, look at Josephus, look at Eusebius, both of these being ancient historians, both of them point to these next 30 years following the death and resurrection of Jesus up until the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70, they both characterize this time as a, as a time being prevalent with false messiahs and false prophets. They were arrested on a daily basis. The second thing that Jesus says will serve as a sign of this coming is military conflict. Look again at verse 7. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is not yet. Listen, I'm sure you're like me. I cannot even begin to tell you the number of times I have heard this verse here in Mark 13, verse 7, referenced in light of current events to tell me that Jesus is coming again soon. Russia invades Ukraine, wars and rumors of wars. U.S. at war with Iraq and Afghanistan, wars and rumors of wars. On and on you could go throughout history, the Korean War, Vietnam War, World War II, World War I. In each generation, you have those who interpret this chapter differently than I do, and they point to the current military conflicts going on that we hear about constantly on cable news, and they point us to this is proof that wars and rumors of wars are happening, and thus the end must be near. But again, I don't think that Jesus is pointing here to a time in our day. But he's pointing this generation, these disciples, to something that's going to take place in their lifetime. And again, we find sure fulfillment of this during this period. This time between the death of Jesus in AD 33 and the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple in AD 70 was a time of countless military conflicts. An uprising in Caesarea took 20,000 Jewish lives. Scythopolis, 13,000 were killed. Alexandria, 50,000 were killed. Damascus, 10,000 were killed. The Annals of Tacitus, which was a historical book written during this time that covers historically the events between AD 14 and AD 68, uses these four words to describe 
this period of history, a time of disturbances, commotions, insurrections, and wars. The disciples wanted signs to alert them that this destruction of the temple was near, and Jesus says, look for military conflict. And conflict after conflict they would see in the next 30 years. The third thing that he points them to is political upheaval and natural disasters. Verse 8, for nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Again, this sort of political upheaval was very much characteristic of this Jewish and Roman world over these next few decades, going right alongside these wars and conflicts taking place. And then natural disasters, he said, will happen. There will be earthquakes in various places, and there will be famines. We have famines recorded for us throughout the book of Acts, Acts 11, 28 being one of them. There were three famines that occurred during the reign of Claudius. Both Roman historians, Tacitus and Suetonius, mention this next 30 years as a unique period in the Roman history, in Roman, Roman Empire history that is prevalent with earthquakes and famines and so forth. On and on I could read examples from this time of these sorts of natural disasters. The point is false messiahs, wars, conflicts, political upheaval, natural disasters, famine, earthquakes. You want a sign that what I just said is about to take place, the destruction of the temple? Well, look to all of these things. And all of these things did end up taking place. But Jesus says, look at the end of verse 8. But these are just the beginnings of the birth pains. They just alert you to the fact that something is coming. Something is on the horizon. That God's judgment against Jerusalem and God's judgment against the temple was about to begin. Now verses 5 through 8, he points the disciples to signs that are going to happen in the world around them. Now he goes on to start to point them to things that are actually going to happen personally to them. The first thing he points them to, number four, is that religious persecution would happen to them. They would face religious persecution. Look at verse 9. Be on guard, for they will deliver you over to councils, and you will be beaten in synagogues, and you will stand before governors and kings for my sake. This is a quick side note. I think another indicator for us that Jesus has in mind here a first century fulfillment is the fact that they will be beaten in synagogues. And, count, and before councils. After AD 70, when the Jewish religious and political system ceased to exist, there would be no more official Jewish councils and synagogues for this to take place before. Again, though, we see fulfillment of this throughout the books of Acts. Acts 4, Acts 5, Acts 12, Acts 23, Acts 24. Throughout the book, we see the apostles, uh, this very thing happening, don't we? Bringing before councils, being beaten, standing trial with this sort of religious persecution. Look at verse 11. He offers some counsel in that day, some encouragement. But when they bring you to trial, deliver you over. Don't be anxious beforehand what you are to say. But say what's ever given to you in that hour, for it's not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. He encourages them. That helper that he said he was going to send to them upon his departure from this earth, he, he would provide for them what they needed in that day of religious persecution. Number five, Jesus also says that they would experience intense personal hatred. Go on in verses 12 and 13. He says, Then brother will deliver brother over to death. The father his child and child will rise against parents and have them put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. Not just in the religious realm, but in the realm of the family, and in the cultural realm. Jesus is drawing his disciples to understand, teaching his disciples, preparing them to understand that as that day draws near, as God's judgment comes upon Jerusalem and upon the temple, his followers, his disciples, will face intense personal hatred that they have, to this point, probably never experienced before. Well, the final thing that he points us to is there in verse 10, and you may have noticed that I skipped that verse, and that was intentional. We come back to it now. The final thing that he says is that there would be widespread preaching of the gospel. Look at verse 10. And the gospel must first be proclaimed to all nations. Now, hopefully you've been tracking with me so far. I know it's been a lot. But so far, everything we've said from verses 5 through 13 is pretty easy to swallow 
when thinking about a first century fulfillment, isn't it? It is pretty easy to understand just looking historically, okay, wars, rumors of wars, persecution, natural disasters, all of that makes sense. That's pretty easy to swallow. Things are going to get a little bit harder for you, verse 14 on, the abomination of desolation, the great tribulation, the return of Jesus in clouds of glory, what does that mean, so on. That's where we're going to turn next week. But here in verse 10, perhaps this verse also leaves you a little bit perplexed to how verse 10 could have actually been fulfilled in that generation. In fact, this verse in verse 10 is one of the most often cited passages for those who would argue that Jesus is referring to the end of human history. What they would say is that, see, Jesus says the gospel must first be proclaimed to all nations, and we know that there are people groups. We know that there are people, even today, who have never heard the gospel. Thus, verse 10 could not have yet been fulfilled. Before I tell you what I think Jesus is referring to and how I think this verse actually was fulfilled in the first generation, let me make it clear first that I 100% passionately believe that it is still today the responsibility of the church to preach the gospel throughout the entire world to every single people group. Listen, this is a responsibility the church has had from the very, very beginning. It's a responsibility that the church has today, a responsibility that the church will have until the day that Christ does in fact return. The Great Commission in Matthew 28 leaves no loopholes for us as followers of Christ. We must labor in the grace of God to proclaim the gospel to make disciples of every single nation in the world. No question about that. My argument to you this morning, though, is that verse 10 has nothing to do with that. That here in Mark 13, verse 10, that is not what Jesus is talking about, is our continued mandate to this day. The major question for us is how would the original hearers have understood this prophecy in verse 10? That the gospel must first be proclaimed to all nations. Well, for the first century audience, I believe that what they would have heard and what they would have expected is for the known world around them, the Mediterranean world of that day, the lesser known areas to the better known areas, that all of that world would have known and heard the gospel. Uh, the, the, the parallel passage in Matthew's account of this Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24 says this, that the gospel must be preached throughout the world as a testimony to all nations. How would they have understood this phrase that the gospel is going to be preached throughout the world? Would they have understood that to mean the world they knew? Or would they have understood that to mean every corner of the world like we would understand it today and our global perspective on things? Listen to how this word is used a few times elsewhere in Scripture. The exact same word is used in Luke 2 1. We read, In those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. What, did, what was meant by this? When Caesar said that all the world had been registered, what was he referring to? Well, clearly he was referring to the Roman Empire over which Caesar Augustus had the authority to issue such a decree. Uh, again, Acts 11:28, we read that Agabus stood up and foretold the, by the Spirit that there would be a great famine over all the world. Acts 24, verse 5, we read, For we have found that this man Paul, a plague, one who stirs up riots among the Jews throughout the world. In each of these instances of this word, uk umene, the world was limited to the Roman Empire of that first century. So the point of Jesus' sign that he declares here in verse 10 that the gospel must first be, be proclaimed to all nations, I believe, is that the whole region, including all Gentiles, not just the Jews, would hear the proclamation of the good news of the gospel. So then we have to ask this question, well, did this occur? Did this happen in the first century as Jesus prophesied? I believe it did. Listen to what Paul says in Colossians chapter 1. Verses 5 through 6, writing before AD 70, he writes this. Of this you have heard before in the word of truth, the gospel which has come to you, listen to this, as indeed in the whole world it is bearing fruit and growing. Similarly, Paul writes in Romans 1, verse 8, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith is being proclaimed, listen, in all the world. Romans 10, 8, lastly, 
Speaking of this gospel proclamation, Paul writes that their voice has gone out to all the earth and their words to all the world. So as far as Jesus' prophecy is concerned here in verse 10, I believe his point is that following his resurrection, the gospel would be proclaimed outside the boundaries of Judea, such that the Gentile nations and the inhabited world known as the Roman Empire would hear the testimony of his redemptive work. And only after that took place, Jesus says, will the end of the city and the end of the temple occur. And I believe it did happen. That did happen for sure. Well, I think that's a good stopping point for us. We will pick up in verse 14. Next week, we will look at the abomination of desolation, this great tribulation, the coming of the Son of Man with great power and glory. My challenge to you this week is to read those passages and and consider, well, Zach says that all of these have already happened. How in the world could that be? And I hope, Lord willing, to come back next week and to show you how I believe those things were indeed fulfilled. Well, listen, as we close this morning, I just want to say from the outside, I, uh, outside, I know that is a lot. Right? But I believe that as faithful stewards of God's word and as faithful students of God's word, listen, there are times, aren't there, where we need to dive deep into the weeds, where we have to dive deep into the weeds. We have to dive deep into the complexities of God's word and the prophecies contained in it if we are going to know what his word is saying to us and how we are to respond to that word. And as we close our time together this morning in God's word, and as we uh, prepare our hearts to come to this table this morning, no matter how confused you're leaving this morning, your head's swirling, I have no idea what to make of all of this, or no matter how much clarity you may think you may have, I just want to remind you a few things that I hope we come face to face with from this passage, from this chapter, and then pray as we approach this table. The first thing that we're reminded from this passage is that, listen, Jesus is a true prophet. He prophesied that all of these things took place, and they did, or they will, depending on which way you interpret it. But he is no liar. He is no false prophet like the passage that Steve read for us this morning from Deuteronomy. He is no false prophet. He is a true prophet. The second thing we should be reminded of is that Scripture is true and reliable. We can have confidence this morning that as we come to this word, that, that there's no question in our mind that Jesus might have been wrong. There's no question in our mind that maybe there's an error there. We can have confidence this morning that, you, that God's word is true and reliable. Two more. Number three, we should come face to face with this fact this morning that Jesus, as the spotless lamb of God, who in just a couple days would offer his life up as a sacrificial substitute for his people, that this Jesus is better than and is a fulfillment of everything that the Old Testament pointed to and everything that prophecy pointed to. He was and is the better Adam, the better Moses, the better sacrifice. And in the context of Mark 13, listen, he is the better temple. And finally, we should be reminded this morning that this Jesus who is higher and better than all of these things who would come in judgment against the false religion of these Jews and the atrocities taking place against the t- in the temple in AD 70, that this same Jesus, just as he came in judgment against them, that he will come one day in judgment against us and our sin. That there is coming a day when Jesus will return. He will return physically. He will return finally to save his people from their sins and to judge his enemies fully and finally. What we celebrate this morning as we take these elements is the work that Jesus did to make us on the right side of that equation. The work that Jesus did to reconcile us with the Father. The work that Jesus did to atone us from our sin, to rescue us from this judgment, to reconcile us to both himself and to one another. Let's go to him in prayer now before we come to this table in celebration.